Miracles are wonderful, but the kind of faith that hangs on, even when things don't look like they're changing, is the kind of faith that brings spiritual maturity that makes us God's servant, not God our servant. He has called us to pray. He has called us to intercede. If we do our part, God will do his. And God, or Jesus taught us about prayer. And I want to talk about the template of prayer this morning. It's very simple. And hopefully I can get, to get through this quick enough so you guys can make it to Chili's on time. So there are four things actually that I want to mention with reference to the things that Jesus taught us. So they are this. Jesus taught us about the form of prayer. He taught us about the force or the power of prayer. He's talked to us about how as we pray we're a family with God and how to pray like the bride of Christ, not like a widow. So if you look at Luke 11, and I want you to read with me those first views. I'm reading from the New King James here. So it came to pass in chapter 11, verse 1, as he was praying in a certain place, when he stopped or ceased, one of the disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. Note this right away. They didn't say, Lord, teach us how to pray. Though he does that, he says, teach us to pray. The problem is, too often, we think that we're praying because we're worried about something. We think we're praying because when we pray, we, uh, we uh, complain about what's going on. Are you there? Did you guys freeze up on me? Okay, good. <clears throat> TJ, good. So he said to them, when you pray, pray this way, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day by day our daily bread and forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And he said to them, Which of you shall have a friend? And go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has come to me on his journey and have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within, saying, Do not trouble me. The door is now shut. My children are in bed. I cannot rise to give you. I say to you, though he will not rise and give to him, because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence, he will rise and give him as many as he needs. Let me just mention in the King James, it uses the term importunity. It means to ask a bold, um, radical request. I wonder how many times we pray just wimpy prayers. God, just kind of make things easier for us, oh, please. But do we believe in such a way that we ask for big things? Jesus is trying to illustrate that this importunity is the guy had the nerve to wake him up in the middle of the night and say, would you give me something? 7-Eleven's closed. We, we need some food. So I ask you, or I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it shall be opened. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it shall be opened. And if a son asks for bread from any father among us, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. So let's begin this way this morning. We begin with the form that Jesus says. This is how we learn to pray. We come into his presence with worship. What we did this morning wasn't a prelim to the sermon. As we worship this morning, we're coming into the presence of the Lord and honoring and worshiping and glorifying his name. We begin by saying, Lord, you're holy. There's only one who is holy, and that's the Lord. When they describe God in the scriptures, the word that's used more than any other word is the word holy. And it simply means there's no one else like him. The second thing he taught us to do is give praise. Yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Sometimes as we get ready to pray, we're tempted to talk about the things that are not happening or tempting to talk about those things that have been a disappointment or the things that we just kind of had 
given up on. But he says, you come in and say, but Lord, in the midst of everything that's going on, yours is the kingdom. Yours is the power. And yours, O oh Lord, is the glory forever and forever. Someone say amen. amen. Then we're we actually encouraged by the Lord to make petitions. Some people say, well, you shouldn't ask God because he already knows what you need before you ask. Jesus is the one who said, let your you know, request be known. Paul said the same thing. Let your request be known to God with thanksgiving. So he give us our daily bread. And then he encourages us not to just be sloppy about it and say, well, I've asked and I'm going to move on. I've asked. I'm going to move on. He says, ask, seek it out. And if it doesn't immediately happen, knock on some doors. One of the sisters this week sent me a prayer request and said, pray for me for a new job. I got a uh, text the other day. It said, Pastor, We've been praying, and I knocked on some doors, and God opened a door, and so she's got a new job. So we give the Lord praise. Amen? God knows and wants to hear what our wants are. He tells us to ask. It is a conversation. It's a communication. It is a reciprocating dialogue based on a father, son, and daughter relationship. We're talking to the Lord. Also, we come before the Lord with humility and forgiveness. I want to say to you that the key, Jack Hayford, one of my pastors and mentors, wrote a book, a little bitty thing years ago, said forgiveness is everything. I want to tell you something. If you're not willing to forgive, everything that God could do for you will be stymied when you, for, when you fail to forgive. Forgiveness opens the door to God being able to answer the cry of your heart. Jesus said it. If you don't forgive, how can you be forgiven? I often ask people, you know, when you have something so hurtful and so hard that you cannot think of even begin to think about forgiving, just think about the things that you have done. And some of those things you don't want to talk about. But imagine if you needed forgiveness and someone said, no, sorry, You've, you went too far. I can't forgive you. I don't want that. When I've failed someone, when I've messed up, I don't want someone to hold it against me. I want to forgive, and the Bible says, as I forgive, I'll be forgiven. And what's most important is the one who sees my heart and sees my willingness to forgive says, because you forgave, I forgive you. It's a key kingdom principle. Forgive, and you shall be forgiven. Walking in humility. Lord, we are dependent upon you. We understand that we've sinned and we've failed, we miss it. The next thing he said is, is to be submitted to the authority of the Lord. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God's will is our true authority, asking according to his will. I know people sometimes struggle with this. I don't know if I know what God's will is. Well, the best way to know what God's will is to look at is what this book is. This is the Holy Ghost Owner's Manual right here. If you want to know what, if it's written here, dear ones, it's his will. Can you say amen to that? Amen. If it's, some people get struggled. You know, I know there's certain things that we have, decisions we have to make. But I, I want to tell you something. The best information you have may still be in, inadequate for you to feel total confidence that you're asking the right thing or making the right decision. Now, if that makes anybody sweat, I hope it removes the whole, whole idea of worrying about fumbling along and asking or, or making the wrong decision. Do you know it's God's responsibility if you're seeking him to make sure that you make the right decision? The Bible says, when you're moving toward a thing, you will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, this is the way, walk in it. So that means God is going to guide you, and as you are walking in humility before the Lord and seeking his will, when you ask, knowing, I'm asking in faith, and God's not up there going, oh my gosh, did you see what they asked? That's certainly going to destroy everything. So, all right, you asked it, there it is. Can you imagine how awful that would be if, if God's up there, ah, they're, this, they don't know what they just asked, so this is going to be destructive. God isn't going to do something destructive in your life. He knows if you're crying out to him, he will guide you. And there will be times when, Lord, I'm just walking by faith, trusting I'm making the right decision. I've asked you to help me. And you know what? God has promised that when we ask according to his will, it will be done. 
Now, I love the fact that Jesus specifically said there, we can expect when we pray that the things that he has said here about the kingdom will be ours today. I know there are people who do not believe that we're to expect great miracles and signs and wonders. But Jesus set the example, and I'll say this, I've said it many times, Jesus Christ is perfect theology. What you see Jesus do is exactly what his Father is doing. In fact, over and over again, Jesus said, I only say what I hear my Father saying. I only do what I see my Father doing. So Jesus was submitted to the Father, and he taught us to say, Thy will be done on earth. That means we can expect that what God says is the, the nature of heaven, what, what his will is in a place where he has complete authority, he wants us to bring that authority upon this earth. And I believe, by the way, that means healing of sickness and disease, bringing peace and safety when there seems to be nothing but chaos. What are we here for if we're not to be that source of power, that source of hope, that in our invasion of the realm of darkness we bring light and hope? What other reason would we be here? The world is dark all around us, and Jesus said, Arise, shine, for your light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. God has made you and me a light. He's made us one who has influence. Jesus didn't say, Jesus did not say, now when you pray this, thy kingdom come thing, don't, don't, don't get too hasty now, don't expect an answer. Don't get too carried away with all your hope and your faith. That's not what Jesus said. He said, ask, seek, knock, expect. And I've said this before. A great Bible scholar once said, if Jesus told us to pray, if we believe prayer works, then it's silly not to pray. But if we don't think prayer works, then it's stupid for us to pray. So the question comes down, in the midst of everything we're going through, are we going to sit by and say, well, you know, Things are going to get wax, you know, wax worse and worse, so let's just kind of let the earth rot in its own filth. We are called to make a difference in this world. Now, <clears throat> this prayer is not a formula for repetition. Now, by the way, I, I don't have a problem with people who repeat the Lord's Prayer, but I do have a problem with, with people making it just a rote and recital thing you do Okay, let's all say these words together and somehow, folks, these are the words of Jesus and you don't just slop your way through. Okay, let's see if we get this right. Uh, our Father which art in heaven, you know. We have to understand how deeply this truth that Jesus taught us. Our petitions are not confined to bread. Forgiveness is not requested in specifics or is requested in specifics, not generalities. Pray for the entry of God's kingdom into earth situation. That happens when we pray on purpose with faith, believing that God is going to do a thing, and it might not happen in a moment. Let me ask something. How many here have prayed something fervently and it didn't happen right away? Let me see some hands. Okay, I like to see honest people here. Because we've all done it. We prayed, run. I've, I don't know what's the deal here. I pray and pray. It doesn't seem it's happening. Well, the enemy would love to cause an offense. He'd love to make you think, well, I've tried that and it didn't work. I want to tell you something. We are called not to try Jesus, but to be people of faith who stand our ground. And I'll say more about it as we get close to the conclusion. That's the form Jesus gave. The second thing that he taught us is there is power, the force of our prayers. The power of our prayer is not in our vocabulary. Now, I believe in carefully pract uh, uh, crafted prayers. I, I believe that we should know how, when we're praying that we've actually thought through the prayer, not just throwing out a bunch of words. Uh, I like one illustration. That some people pray like a shotgun. They just hope that as they fire that, the buckshot will go out, and maybe they'll hit something. Maybe something they're praying about might get a pellet or two and a, and a gift from God will drop to our 
to our, <laughs> our needs. I like the prayers that Jesus, uh, the, the scripture talks about being people who uh, draw the arrow and that the prayers are so specific that it's like pulling a bow and arrow and the arrow hits directly to the targeted need. It's important for us to, and even if we don't really understand exactly how to, to delineate what we're praying for, but to at least seek the Lord to say, God, how, how do I need to pray? Maybe I don't understand it all, but if I could just pick, I think this one area, and I'm going to draw a bead on that, and that's the sound effect of an arrow. <laughs> By the way, it's not in the volume of your prayer. By the way, I get loud when I pray. In fact, if I'm here alone, I do a lot of yelling. I pray loudly, because not because God's deaf, but because I need to hear what I'm praying. I don't believe, listen, God hears even a whispered prayer. There's a song we used to sing called, Whisper His Name, Whisper His Name, Whisper His Name, and He will run to you. I believe that. But I also believe there's times when we are engaged in a spiritual battle that we lift our voice. But by the way, the power in our prayer is not in our volume, though we may get loud. It's not in the length of our prayer, though I may pray for hours about a thing. One of my mentors, again, Roy Hicks Jr., he said this years ago. He said, it's not the length of the prayer, it's the strength of your prayer because we believe God. Also, the force of our prayer really comes down to our conviction. Do we really believe what we're asking for? And do we really believe that when we cry out, God hears our cry? Again, I, I, I know I, I might be belaboring, but I, how many of you have ever prayed and thought, God, did you even hear me? Yeah, let's see some hands, yeah. Now, you see, if you admit it, it doesn't mean you're in unbelief. It just says, yeah, I struggle. Listen, if you haven't struggled in these things, I question whether or not you really know what you're doing when it comes to prayer. Because this is a battlefield. This is a place where the enemy would seek to, to impose an offense because we didn't see what's happening. That's why I, I cling to this little st statement that I learned again from one of my mentors who said, God is not our servant, we are his. So when I do something that he's commanded me to do, like pray, then I'm not bossing God around. I'm doing what he told me to do. And he said, when you get into these situations, pray for peace. When you see these situations where there needs to be a divine intervention, pray for healing and deliverance. He said, to, I'm giving you the commission and the authority to operate as I would if I were there. And because you are there, I'm in you and you're in me, then you operate with that boldness and that force of power, knowing I have the conviction that when I pray, God will hear me. You believe it, it's, he's going to hear you. The conviction that you have about your prayers will produce another great thing, and that's persistence. If you really believe, and it's not yet happened, do you press in beyond your weariness? I want to tell you, since October 7th, when I woke up in South Dakota on my way back here, that morning I woke up, I began to pray for Israel like there was no tomorrow. And I prayed every day, I have prayed every day, many times a day for Israel, because God has commanded us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Right now, war is in that land. Do I give up or do I continue to pray when the Lord said, pray for the peace of Jerusalem? I'm praying that because my conviction is God said to do it, and if my conviction is that God's word is true, then why would I stop? I will pray, I will pray in faith, I will persist in that. And I also believe this, folks. At one point, Jesus made a comment to the disciples about, except you eat my blood, or drink my blood and eat my flesh, then you have no part with me. <clears throat> Some of the disciples said, <clears throat> that is the weirdest thing I've ever heard. And they were laughed. And Jesus said to the other disciples who were standing around, he said, because those that left him said, hey, saying that, blood and eating flesh and drinking blood, that's, yeah, we're out of here. 
These are dark sayings, who can hear them? That's what they said. So he turns to his disciples and says, hey, will you guys also go? Oh, this is why I love Peter. Peter gets it right, occasionally. That's why I like him. He's like you, and he's like me. (laughs) He says, Lord, where will we go? Where else would we go? For you have the words. Your words bring life. Where are we going to go? If we don't go to you, where are we going to go? What, what other? There's no other God besides you. There's no other name given among men under heaven whereby a person can be saved. So Peter he got it right. He says, Lord, where would we go? I have no other place but to go. We used to, again, a great old gospel song, Where could I go? Where could I go? Seeking a refuge for my soul. Needing a friend to help me in the end. Lord, where could I go but to the Lord? By the way, prayer is not nagging insistence, but it's praying because you believe that God is listening and he delights to hear. And by the way, God hears it, but who do you think resists those prayers being answered? We find that really clear in the book of Daniel when there were prayers that Daniel prayed for an answer about end times things, the kingdoms and how they were going to be Uh, how the kingdom of God was going to take over other kingdoms. And while he's praying, he prayed for 21 days, and finally an angel showed up with the answer, and he says to Daniel, Daniel, you're a mighty man of God, a favored man of God, and from the moment that you prayed, the answer came, but I was caught up in a spiritual battle in the heavenlies that he had to battle through to get here. What does that mean? That simply means where there's a spiritual warfare battle, principalities and powers. Folks, are you hearing me this morning? There's a battle in the spiritual realm that you don't see. And so when we pray, we're not wrestling with God because he's for us, not against us. We're dealing with, and God, by the way, delights to see his children take the authority of his name, the authority of his word, and insist on heaven's best when earth's worst is happening. This is the privilege that we have to come to God with the conviction that says, I know he hears me, I know this is his will, and I'm going to persist until I see the answer. The next thing Jesus taught us is that we're a family. You know, I have two sons. They're beautiful wives and grandkids that I love with all my heart. Of course, my family, all my family, many of them are here in this church as well. When my family calls on me, they call me Uncle Tom. They don't call, oh, Father, Pastor. (laughs) Uncle Tom, would you pray for something? I might be their pastor, but but I may be an uncle and a brother or whatever. But you know what's interesting? In fact, yesterday I had my cousin call from Gillette, Wyoming, to tell me that she's in dire straits and needs healing from multiple cancers in her body. I told my cousin, I said, Monty, we believe that God is the God of the impossible. No matter what the prognosis or diagnosis is, we still believe that the one who created your body can resurrect and heal it completely. Our relationship with one another gives us this sense of acceptance when we come. We're not coming to some distant deity. In fact, <clears throat> there's a portion of scripture, and I believe, um, I believe, in fact, if you'll quickly turn to Luke 18, everybody, listen, since Paul's not here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a little more than what I'd planned. <laughs> After all, you guys braved the storm. I don't want to rob you. Listen, if you go to Chili's and it's cold, they're still going to f- give you the full menu. That went over like a lead balloon, so we'll just keep moving, all right? <clears throat> but I want you to notice something. We're in relationship with this God. In fact, let me point it out. In Luke 18, Jesus tells this story about a persistent widow. He says, verse 1, men ought always to pray and not to lose heart. 
there was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regard him. Now there was a widow in that city, and she came to him saying, Get justice for me from my adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterwards he said within himself, Though I do not fear God nor give a rip about this woman, yet because she is a widow, who's tr- I added that other part, it's, look it up. <clears throat> Afterward, he said within himself, though I do not fear God nor regard man, and yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she, she wearies me. I start saying, she's killing me. That last verse I'm going to end on this morning, but I want to comment on this other first. Listen, you have a relationship with the Father. What, I, what I'm concerned about is the church often prays like a widow instead of a bride. Let me unpack that in just a moment. First of all, let me go back to this issue of family. Fathers, listen to me. Daddies, mamas, if one of your kids comes to you, one of your grandkids comes to you, and they're crying, Papa, will you help me? Would you lift me up? Would you give me something to eat or whatever, whatever they ask. I remember one time we were going somewhere and, and a dog darted out and my little boy jumped in my arms and I held him up and he looked over his shoulder to make sure that dog wasn't going to get him and he was in my arms and he knew that his daddy was going to protect him. This God we serve is a father. And our relationship that gives us power in our prayer is that we have a relationship with the Father, not an unjust judge who does not care about the law of God or people. We have a Father in heaven. And you don't need to try to please Him. You do not need to try to appease Him. In this relation, relationship you have with Father, it's boldness. I've had my kids at times call me and say, Dad, I'm really desperate... Can you come and help me? I'll tell you a funny story real quick. My oldest boy, Tommy, when he was in high school, sometimes when he'd put his stuff on, the, on his dresser, it would roll, uh, he had specifically had chapstick. <laughs> and one day, now in South Dakota, you need chapstick all the time in the winter, or you dry up. So he'd put stuff, he'd load up his stuff and went to school that morning and about 10 o'clock, I get this frantic call. Dad, you got to come right now and bring me my chapstick because my lips are killing me. <laughs> now, that may not seem funny to you, but I always bug him about that. I said, who would go to the office and say, I need to make an emergency call to my dad for lip gloss or for, for a chapstick? <laughs> you know, believe it or not, as silly as it was, I could have said, you know, borrow some girlfriend's lipstick or lip gloss, you know, but I, I went home and I found that his chapstick had rolled off the dresser and was under the dresser, so I picked it up and I took it to him. I said, well, you're really dumb. No, that's my boy. He just, uh, my lips are killing me. <laughs> you don't want your son being assassinated by sore lips. So, you, you see, we tend to think that things that are important to us are not important to the Lord. But our boldness is that because this is my dad, this is my daddy. I can call on him. It is because of the Father's great love for you that he delights to do whatever it is that you cry out to him. There's nothing that he is not concerned about. But let me try to finish up this morning this way. Our relationship with him is he's not an angry judge or a dishonest or, as the scripture said, a judge who did not fear God. Our God is God. And our God lives by the very conditions or nature of who he is. God is love. God is faithful. God is mighty. He's powerful. He's available. In fact, in that first passage we read, one of the things that's interesting is God's available at any time. That first passage we read, they, they contacted their friend in the middle of the night. Have you ever been so burdened that you couldn't sleep? So you look at your watch and say, oh, good land, it's 3 o'clock in the morning. I only have a couple hours before I have to go to work. But man, I've got to, and you get up and you go and say, God, I'm, this is killing me. I can't think straight. I'm, re- 
I just pray, and, and knowing it that very, the God of Israel never sleeps nor slumbers. Think about it. Everything that's going on right now in Israel isn't because God is asleep and Israel's suffering. God is wide awake. He never sleeps and never slumbers, and he's available at midnight, even though we may think, I don't want to trouble you. Every now and then I'll hear people say, well, you know, I was going to ask for prayer for this, but there are a lot of other people who have greater needs than me. Oh, my God. Are you talking about talking to the Lord God, or are you talking about trying to get a hold of your counselor, your therapist? You call your therapist at 3 in the morning, he's probably going to tell you to shut up and go back to bed. But if you, <laughs> but if you call on the Lord, he's your God. He's your Father. He's going to answer. Now, <clears throat> let me make this clear. What does the Bible say about his church? Does he not say that we are the bride of Christ? Does he not call us as his lovely bride? We are not a widow. Our God lives. Our God is alive. And when we come to him, you know, I I can tell you this, and again, personal illustrations are are one of my privileges because when I met my beautiful wife, I, you know, she kept asking me to marry her, and I said, yes, finally, um, I will marry you. Now, she's not here this morning, but you guys are not laughing as much as you need to, because I have a feeling someone is scheming to tell her what I just said. But actually, I asked her. But I want to tell you something. Uh, when we were dating, there really wasn't anything she could ask that I wouldn't, I wouldn't jump to do for her. In fact, I worked a weird shift at night, I went to school during the day, but I worked this 5 to 2.30 in the morning shift. And Wendy knew that before we were married. So I, on my way home, I would drive through the church parking lot because the church was there and the parsonage was there. But if I drove through and I noticed her bedroom light was on, then I knew that I could rev the engine a little bit and maybe she would come out and talk to me. <laughs> you guys are so holy, just uh, we would never do that. But I needed my sleep bad. But you know what I needed? I, I wanted to see that pretty little face and I wanted to hear voice. And uh, even though her dad was right there, <laughs> we made it quick and short. I missed you all day. I love you. I love you. I love you. you know. When you're in love with someone, you will do anything you can. Listen, we're the bride. And when we cry out to the Lord and say, God, I have a need. I have a need. Someone's oppressing me. Someone is trying to attack me. Then we ask boldly. I mean, if I thought someone was hitting on my, my girlfriend, we'd have a, we would have speaks. <laughs> we'd have a conversation. And if I saw someone who's better looking than me, which is a lot of guys, then I would kind of gear up for war, you know, because I'm going to defend the bride. And I say this simply, and it's probably a poor illustration, but God wants to bring justice to his people. He loves us so much. He wants to bring justice to his people. And when we cry out in a time when the enemy seems to be getting the upper hand, and he seems to be able to to push us around, and we're feeling like we're oppressed, and we're being put in a place where we have no defense, Shall not. This is what the Bible says. If when we were enemies with God, he reconciled us to himself by the death of his son. Shall not God also give to his own people justice when they cry out to him day and night? God is a just God. And when he sees things, now I know there are some who will say, well, I, I was in a situation and it just didn't seem like God took notice. Listen, again, you're battling not just trying to get your prayers because God hears your prayer. But there's an enemy who seeks to discourage and get you to turn back on your faith stance to say, well, I guess he's just too busy or he doesn't hear what I'm saying and he doesn't care. Where are you, God? Where are you? And we've all said that when we've gone through difficult things. Where are you, God, when we cried out to you? But our faith says, even though I don't see the answer, I know this. He is not an unjust judge. He is a deliverer 
who loved me when I was at my worst, when I was the biggest failure, when I was his enemy, when I was in darkness and sin, unable to even cry out, he looked for me, he came after me, and he gave his life for me. The last thing I want to say is this in verse 6. After he says, this is what the judge said. The unjust judge said, unless you kills me with all our prayer requests. I'm going to answer her, but that verse 8 says this. This is Jesus talking. He says, nevertheless, when Jesus returns, will he even find faith on the earth? Now, I used to read that and think, oh, man, that's going to be bad, because what if things get, here, everyone listen to me, what if it gets so bad that everything is apostate and everybody turns their back on, what if Jesus comes back and there's no one going in the rapture? That's not going to happen, dear one. What it's saying is, what Jesus is saying is when he returns, will he find a church who believes in prayer and in their God enough to insist on God's best even when it seems like it's a lost cause? How many times have we prayed for revival and we see that revival comes and goes and we're not seeing what we want to see? How many times have you prayed this in these last several weeks for Israel, but the war, the, the war rages on? How many times have you sought out something and it just seems like it's not happening? Jesus calls us to a place of importunity or passionate persistence to pray till we see the answer. The question Jesus asks is, when the Son of Man returns, will he find people on earth who still have faith to pray and believe for the answer and not give up until they see it happen? Will we be among those that the Lord says, I'm seeking for those who would stand, make up a hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land? Who would pray for America, that God would save America? Who will pray for our world? Will the tragic end of all of existence be that God looked for someone who would pray and stand in the gap that there would not be a destruction of the land, of our nation, of our world, but have to say as he did in Ezekiel, I sought for someone who would pray, but I could not find any. And as a result of that, I had to consume. I had to consume those that were on the earth because I, my wrath had to be poured out. <coughs> Folks, God doesn't want to pour out his wrath. He wants everybody to be saved. But how many of us are praying? I mean, just think about even the ugliest persons that we can think of in this battle. You know, did Jesus die for the people who stand for Hamas? Did he, stand for, did he, did he die for the Palestinians? Did he die for the people in Gaza? Did he die for the Lebanese, Lebanese people? He died for them all. Well, then how do we pray? We pray that your will be done on earth. And we pray that God will turn things around. And that he's looking for people who will not say, well, according to my prophetic scheme here, things will whack worse and worse. So therefore, let's just sit back and say, Jesus, get us the heck out of here. That's not the prayer. The prayer is, God, even so, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. Would you stand with me this morning? This is the cry of the Lord today. Are we going to believe the Lord? Are we going to press in? Are we going to understand God's for us, not against us? Do we really believe that Jesus is coming soon? And before he comes, he wants to see a great harvest of souls. And will we press in and say, yeah, even so, Lord Jesus, come. We're praying, Lord. Would you just put your hands out like this this morning and make this simple prayer? God, make me an intercessor. Let me be a bold prayer warrior. Let me be one who insists on heaven's best, on earth as it is in heaven. Let me be an instrument of righteousness. Let me be an instrument of redemption. 
Let me be one who stands in the gap for the land because we believe, Lord, that your desire is to heal our land, to save the lost, to let the government of Jesus increase ever more because you promised that, that the increase of his government, there should be no end. How could we pray against that when you say, ultimately your kingdom will come in its fullness? We come now believing for what is going to happen now, but knowing that in time, very soon, Jesus will come and all the kings of this world will become the kingdoms of our God in his Christ. This is our prayer. This is our prayer. God, send a mighty move, a revival that shakes the land. We ask that in Jesus' name. If you believe it, church, would you say amen? Well, God bless you. Thanks for being here.